All right, guys, so today we're going to take a look at some numbers and put things in perspective because a lot of people are panicking about Bitcoin, including a lot of my friends and family members. And I'm here to tell you guys that let's just take a look at the let's just step back a little bit, zoom out and take a look at what the returns are here for Bitcoin. So starting from 2011 till 2021, Bitcoin has performed on an annualized level 197%. This is an asset class you do not want to be selling just because the Federal Reserve states that they're going to be raising interest rates. Now, by the way, this actually goes off the heels that the Fed started to you know, taper and raise interest rates somewhere here in the bear market in 18 and going into 19. But Bitcoin went down 73% in 18. So granted, it was an asset class that just completely fell apart. But if you take a look at all the other years, we had 1,331% in 2017, uh, 125% in 16, in 2020, it did 3x, and 2019, it did 100x for a yearly return for this year, it did for 2021, it did 66% outperforming commodities, REITs, uh, large caps, uh, NASDAQ, small caps, uh, and EA stocks. And so annualized, even if you take a look at Bitcoin as a risk on asset, it's it's clearly blown every single asset out of the water. And so when you people take a look and say, oh, my God, I think Bitcoin's going to go down. Maybe it can go down 50, 70 percent. It is very, very possible. Again, it, it kind of tends to kind of do that uh, historically. It does at least a 50, 50 percent drops uh, very, very often. But the thing is that Bitcoin is still a very, very early asset. So even if you take your money out of Bitcoin, even during a Fed interest rate hike, um, usually it'll bounce right back the next year. Right. It'll, it'll, it'll bounce back within a couple of years and then some. And so even if Bitcoin does not make 197 percent annualized, it could be making 50, 60 percent percent annualized gains. Um, and the simple reason is because it's a risk on asset and it's still very, very um, undervalued relative to its penetration rates. Um, in many households, not a lot of people own Bitcoin. Right. And so let me go ahead and give you another stats. Uh, in here, and this is from Charlie uh, Bileo. He's on Twitter, which I follow him a lot because I tend to kind of use his stuff here. But um, he mentioned really, really interesting something about, um, you know, where we're at right now in the cycle, which is if you take a look at um, uh, ETH, ETH is down about 38% from its 2021 high, right? So uh, Binance 39. So these are all double digit hits on a lot of these alts. Uh, now, Bitcoin obviously has... It's not at that level. They're you know clearly in that thirty percent kind of level. But um, the point I'm trying to make is that the volatility is actually a good thing because it gives you access to buying some more of those tokens at a cheaper price. Had you not had that volatility. Now again, uh, taking a look at the correlations with uh, corrections for Bitcoin as an all-time high, including looking at corrections from multi-year cycles, it's clear to see that the current one that we're at that started it on November 10th, um, that's already been almost, um, I, I'd say what, two months already uh, here, uh, when Bitcoin was at 68,000 to a $40,000 low, it's already dropped about 41%. And, and this is pretty much normal in line with what has happened before. And But the more important thing is that Bitcoin's return to the all-time high has outperformed some of the um, some of the declines. So even if you drop by 41% here, um, you got 71% of that back. Now, granted, if you bought at the top, I mean, you, you would need a lot more than 70% to break even. But the point I'm trying to make is Bitcoin tends to hit a new all-time high uh, here. So for example, on May of last year till, till June of April, sorry, April, Bitcoin lost 55% of its value, right? And all of a sudden, it ripped 123% back. Uh, and it took about 100, 120 days. So it took about four months to get to that new high. <coughs> Excuse me. And then if you take a look at um, from January of 8th till uh, January the 21st, Bitcoin dropped 31% in just a span of um, a couple of, of 13 days. And this was actually going back to almost the same time this year, right? So, so Bitcoin had done a 13-day slide, which was 31, 
and at that time it it got back 45 percent so the odds here that bitcoin is going to go back up is very very high right um and the reason is because if you take a look at historically what has happened with the exception of the 1718 bear market which lost another 84 percent bitcoin eventually went to get to become a 5x and this was like the longest time period but on average you can kind of see that they normally these are more of the outliers the 1079 and the 1181 generally you're looking at three to four months uh three to four month period so based off what i'm seeing right now you know historically speaking unless we're in a bear market bitcoin's probably going to recover um very very soon right in fact it may go past the sixty-eight thousand dollar mark um assuming that it's actually going there now another important thing to notice is that in 2021 bitcoin touched that 29,000 28,000 twice so even if you think we're in a bear market there's a very high chance it's going to serve as a big support it's only 10,000 points from that area which is another like 20 percent which is it just going to fall in line with us um and granted this is a much more mature asset class so relative to what we saw back here when it lost 94 percent i don't think we're gonna see that because Historically speaking, these type of asset classes don't really kind of go down that much when they're already that high. So again, a, a little bit of hopium here for you in mentioning that even though Bitcoin has dropped down 41, it's it's within historical range. And, and like I said, with the exceptions of those bear markets that we saw here in 11, in 18, and in 15, right? And, and so this was a two-year kind of period and also in 2010. Uh, so another kind of piece of news um, now here's here's this is really interesting. This is like the power of holding and hodling. Uh, these are the best stocks. So let's say you weren't in Bitcoin, which would have outperformed this anyway. But if you had put let's just say ten thousand dollars in like Monster, you in Monster Beverages, which is kind of interesting. People don't really think about that as a good stock. You had an analyzed return of thirty four percent, but Bitcoin has already gone up to plus a hundred plus percent per year. So, in a way, um, even if you would have picked the best stocks here, um, your best bet would have been thirty four percent, thirty six. Nvidia was thirty three over over a span of um, over the span of thirty years. Right. So it's kind of interesting that to see that these returns, if you continuously add to it, you're eventually going to hit these analyzed returns of at least thirty percent. Now, Bitcoin has more volatility to it, but if you take a look at the historical um, annualized uh, return since Bitcoin started, it was 197%. So, <clears throat> again, you know, as far as your money of where, of where, what, what's, what's the best way to put your money in? Generally speaking, at best, you're going to get about an annualized 34, assuming for the volatility you get. So, Monster 34, Amazon 36, uh, Pool is 29, Nvidia 33%. Apple is only 22% analyzed per year. So um, it's kind of interesting to see that you would have to beat, if you can't beat this, then obviously if, if Bitcoin cannot beat this, then you wouldn't be in Bitcoin, right? <clears throat> All right, so here's another thing with, um, this one actually is a little bit more, more important. This is actually has to do with the COVID cases and the deaths. So we, you know, we're seeing a lot of news about the Omicron case and a lot of the issues with um, the COVID situation. But if you take a look at the daily cases here, the daily cases have definitely gone up, but the actual death rates have come down quite a bit. And so what this actually tells me is people are getting infected, but they're actually not dying, which is a good thing. And what that usually translates to is a more robust economy. We're not kind of heading into this like recession kind of crash that people are talking about. And the Fed is going to have to accommodate that for a lot of different reasons, because obviously this is still an issue. But it's creating more disruptions than anything else because it's not as deadly as people think it may be. And because of that, that's probably going to have a ripple effect to the economy later down the road. Now, this is actually super interesting because if you take a look at the tech sector, it's been getting beaten up with crypto the same way as crypto has come down. Now, uh, these are the price to sales ratios for many of the tech stocks. For example, Zoom, Lemonade, Coop, Palantir. And these are a lot of these stay-at-home stocks that happened last year when they had a super, in 2020 and 2021, when they had a super run. And the reason was because people thought that, you know, we're going to do digital all the time. Once we reopen, all that money left. But what's happening now is that these are trading like value stocks, which is very interesting, almost kind of like if the dot-com bubble had burst. But the thing is that these are real products right so docusign we use i use uh i use zoom we use um 
uh, Roku, these actually have, have tangible products. And the fact that they're trading like this with double digit revenue growth to me um, kind of begs the question of who's selling. And same thing with Bitcoin. Bitcoin has revenue growth, it has adoption, it has mainstream adoption. Ethereum is actually much more valuable, in my opinion. But if you take a look at some of these uh, valuations, the market is, I think, is getting it wrong here. And uh, this is kind of something better to kind of take a look at. Uh, Robinhood and, and, and Coinbase are actually trading at a lower valuation than something like a Charles Schwab, which, by the way, is as a good company, but is not innovating at the rate that Robinhood and Coinbase is. And so what had happened was early in 2021, when the market got really excited and really hyped up, they pushed these valuations very high. But now the market has swung the other direction. And what they're doing here is that they're punishing this for growth in the future, which I think it's a mistake uh, because Co Coin, uh, Coinbase and Robinhood are at the forefront of a lot of the innovation happening with crypto and also with the way they make it easy for people to invest in. And I think that sector is just going to continue to grow. I don't think that Schwab is going to be the leader in that space. But the problem here is the market just decides to sell up because for whatever reason, the Fed interest rates or the inflation or the CPI data, whatever that everybody kind of comes up with. But I think there's going to be a lot of opportunity here in the next couple of years to kind of pick up some of these companies. Um, and I kind of just wanted to show you guys about uh, a gold and Berkshire Hathaway. So, you know, this is very interesting because gold has underperformed, obviously, in the market. And we've seen um, stocks like Berkshire Hathaway or some of the small, better value uh, stocks underperform back in 2010, 11. And then now you're getting kind of that flip, right? And so even though both of them have reached 548%, they did it in a very different way. Uh, first off, timing does matter. Um and uh, and also, also market cycles do matter. So in 2011, we're reeling from a lot of that financial crisis that happened in eight that spread over to Europe. And what had happened was gold became a flight to safety and stocks got punished in 2010, 11. But then gold got, got higher. And then once the market kind of recovered in 15, uh, stocks kind of came right back. But the point I'm trying to make with this is that, you know, two asset classes could be generating the exact same return, but it's just kind of like that rotation that we're getting. And so I think it's important to understand that, you know, at this time, there could be a chance that gold could underperform here, uh, but it could be a chance that the stocks could continue to over outperform. So it's really interesting to see that even though uh, these two are, are totally opposite in many different ways, they still have the average return over the last 20 years. OK, so that's kind of interesting to see. All right. Another one that uh, kind of came up was the interest rates. So we've been talking about the 17, 10 year yield on the interest rates that, you know, why the interest interest rates are going up. It's because, again, the Fed is going to be hiking, going to be tightening. Uh, it's not going to allow that money to free flow into the economy. And I, usually that's usually bad for the stock market, usually bad for risk on assets like, like crypto, because people don't people don't have easy money anymore. But the thing is, you have to understand is that interest rates, raise, rising, raising interest rates is actually um, a rebalance back to what what had happened for the last two years and COVID kind of changed all of that because the Fed decided to lower those interest rates so much that obviously uh, at this point people had access to that cheap money and at some point you got to pay off that debt but the thing is that this has no bearing on the fundamentals of the company right many of the companies and many of the projects and many of the uh, crypto projects out there they're still building and they're still developing so the fact is that yeah it's going to be tougher to get money into the into new pro newer projects but what is going to be uh, more interesting is what if these projects actually do very well I think that there is going to be still money available. I don't think it's going to automatically like disappear, but I do think that there will be more money uh, for the better ones. Maybe it's not going to be as crazy as it was, but the, the fact is we're still at a very low rate on these interest rates. And so even if the Fed does raise interest rates here, um, we are going to see that. Now, there's one little trick to that, though. The one trick has more to do with the uh, unemployment rate that we're seeing, the 3.9% that we see. 3.9% has been around for a while. It actually marked a lot of the a lot of the uh, turmoil in the market. So, for example, in 2018, when the unemployment rate was at 3.9%, the 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 funds rate, the federal funds rate, were at 2.27. You had only 1.9% uh, inflation. In this year, in 2021, we had a same thing. We have a 3.9, but the funds rate was 0 
and we also had a, a very high inflation rate, which means the real funds rate was actually negative six six point seventy two. So that has to be, that has to autocorrect, right? Because historically we have not had negative interest rates until until like February of nineteen fifty seven. In April of 1957. Other than that, it's been pretty positive. And also in April and July, we kind of had some negative values there. But for the most part, what what's happening right now is that, you know, if you take a look at the bear market case, um, obviously that happened in, in 2018 when they had actually the lowered unemployment rate. But what had happened right afterwards in 2019 was we saw this massive run. So even though 2022 could potentially be kind of like a bear market situation right around the corner is the situation where we could be getting those 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 gains back right um and uh and just to kind of show you guys again from a from a more of a charting perspective you can kind of see the unemployment number has come right back down so the fed has already done its job which is lower that unemployment rate from 14.7 percent down to 3.9 by holding up the economy and now they want to cool it off and the last time we had that was in April of 2000, May of 1969. Now, remember that the dot-com bubble uh, happened in March of 20, 2000, right? And after that, we had a major rotation going into value stocks right afterwards, which eventually um, led to our second recession um, that happened in 2008. But, you know, the point I'm trying to make here is that the stocks are going to be, probably become very cheap in the near future. You're probably going to get some sort of situation where we could get a, a correction, but that's going to eventually rotate back out. And um, as long as that unemployment rates are are low, uh, just like from historical uh, perspective, is that you're going to see that the Fed is not going to be as accommodative as you as you as normally you would. Okay, and then this is the the, the Treasury yields that we'll see the the five three two one Treasury yields. You can kind of see that the one year Treasury yield has actually gone up since July of this year of last year. Uh, the five-year treasury rates at 1.47 percent and I think these rates are just going to continue to go up over time and so liquidity is just going to get crunched here so the good news is is that this is going to be good for the economy because they wouldn't be raising interest rate if the economy is going down but the but the bad news is obviously that's going to create a lot of liquidity issues uh, moving forward okay all right, guys. Well, I kind of talked a little bit, a lot about this, and what I wanted to kind of show you guys again is, so now the question is, um, what about crypto in this case? So, you know, 2022 is going to be a little tricky year. It's not going to be as easy as like 2020 or 2021 because we don't have a lot of that stimulus money. We have the rate hikes. We have the reduction in the balance sheets with the Fed. In addition to that, we're coming off of two really good years in crypto land in terms of gains. And I think it's kind of a little bit greedy to say that we're going to have another up year in 2022. But if we do have a down year, I think we're going to recover easily in 2023. Um, this is not going to be a, a, a year in which basically people are going to say, oh, I'm kind of done with it. Just because historically speaking, even if we come down pretty hard, let's just say another 40 percent, we pretty much we are entering into that bear market. So I'm not really too worried about the the, the the shorter time frames. I'm more worried about that longer time frame macro picture. And generally speaking, in rates where rates are going up, generally it's the economy heating up already. So I think it's actually a good thing. All right. If you enjoyed this video, I'll see you guys next time. See you out.